Welcome everybody to Straight Science. Straight Science is an evening science presentation put on by uh, UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant. Uh, both UAF and Alaska Sea Grant here in Nome, we serve the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. Tonight, like I said, thank you for your patience. We have at times at Straight Science lost speakers, lost internet, lost everything, but we lost our minds tonight because the tiny URL had lost its potency. So you're all were able to come in on the original Zoom. This uh, talk, we're really grateful. I don't know what it is with Rachel, but uh, it was postponed once before and then we had this. So third time, I don't know, Rachel, hopefully be the charm. But for tonight, thank you all for showing up. And Rachel Richardson is a wildlife biologist, biologist with the US Geological Survey in Anchorage at the Alaska Science Center. And tonight, a real true, you know, it's a little out of our range for, for the Bering Strait region, but are you kidding? McKay's buntings, that's the first cousin to the uh, snow bunting. And McKay's bunting is like a neighbor to all up here, just about. So I hope that if you are from Nome and you do see McKay Buntings, know that Rachel is interested, maybe not in the middle of her talk, but she is interested afterwards to hear about uh, our experiences here in the region with the McKay's Bunting and, and maybe the Snow Bunting, I don't know. Know that those birds are, both of them, including your, your McKay's Bunting pictured here, they are the harbingers of spring and much loved throughout the Bering Strait region. One of the biggest things I do want to point is out, because these are the most questions I've ever gotten about a poster, the bird in the poster for this tonight's talk had berry juice on his beak and the feathers around his beak. There was a lot of comments about that picture. So that was an interesting one for us to pick. So anyway, we are pleased to present Rachel. We thank you all for your patience. Take it away, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your hard work too get folks in tonight. So thank you for everybody that showed up and was able to access the talk with the new link. I actually wanted to start this presentation. I, I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here this evening, but I wanted to start the presentation with a short video that's about 10 minutes long that was filmed and produced by Andy Johnson with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology about our visit in 2018 to the St. Matthew Islands. And there may be many of you in the audience that have seen this video before, but I thought I'd share it for those that haven't seen it because it's a really stunning overview of how beautiful this place is. And there's some great footage of McKay's Buntings. And it also gives a little bit of background about changes that are going on in the Bering Sea region and how St. Matthew may be experiencing some of these same changes we're already seeing in other parts of the region. So. I'm going to switch my screen share here and pull up the video. And let's see. It should be coming through now. Let's see. Okay. We can see a still picture. Okay, I'm going to hit play and hopefully the volume will be loud enough for everybody, but just give me a heads up if it. Um, if you can't hear it. This is Andy Johnson from the Union of the Council. We must have a bad time for us. The sound is the best part. The audio is very difficult at this end. It's an unknown. I get pentacles. There you go. Thank you. That's That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steve, do you think I should put the mushrooms in now with the leaks oh. later? And then we have this conversation. No audio at this point. Okay, so I'm getting that there's no audio coming through for you guys. Correct. Well, that's a bummer. I guess I'll have to figure out how to do Tonight's our star cross night, Rachel. Yeah, we're just <laughs> playing around. I'm glad everybody's here. 
if you can't hear it, then I better. You can narrate your way through it. I, I won't be able to do as good a job as Andy does. <laughs> so let's see here. Go back to the presentation. It's all right. Out here, we're a patient crowd, patient audience. That's good. This is a good trial run too. No worries. Okay. And it should be back on the title slide now. Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share information on the case bunting. This is a really special and unique bird. And I am honored to share with you the results from a couple years of this study. I want to recognize project collaborators and co-authors, Courtney Amundsen, Steve Matsuoka, Jim Johnson, Mark Romano, and Audrey Taylor. And this uh, funding and logistical support for this study was provided by the USGS Alaska Science Center, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I also want to give special thanks to the many individuals that are listed here because they assisted us with field work and data collection, field logistics, and study design. And I also want to point out that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service makes visits to the St. Matthew Islands approximately every two to seven years. And so this collaborative study was part of an effort to monitor seabird populations on the islands. But our study focused on the McKay's bunting, which is Alaska's only endemic land bird. McKay's buntings have a breeding range that is restricted to St. Matthew and Hall Islands in the central Bering Sea, which means the global population is breeding only on these two islands. In 2003, biologists conducted the first surveys of the population and they estimated there were approximately 31,000 individuals which is one of the smallest populations for songbirds that are breeding in the US and Canada. The population is potentially vulnerable to these environmental changes that we're seeing in the Bering Sea region. And because they have this really small population size and they're restricted to these islands, they are designated as a species of high conservation concern and are thereby a priority for research and long-term monitoring. McKay's bunting spend their entire life cycle in the Bering Sea region of Alaska. And this range map here shows where they breed, represented by the orange circle, and where they winter, which is represented by the blue line. And now if you look at this blue line, you can see that their wintering range broadly extends along the Bering Sea coast from about Kotzebue Sound to the Alaska Peninsula. So we do have some specific knowledge of areas where they show up in winter, such as Nome, and parts of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, but there may be other locations with notable concentrations of wintering birds that are currently unknown. Now, if you look at the orange circle, you can see that the St. Matthew Islands are approximately 400 kilometers from mainland Alaska. So given this very remote location and the time and expense necessary to get out there, efforts to monitor the population on both islands have only been undertaken twice. So we went back to the islands in 2018 to repeat the same surveys that were conducted in 2003. We had three primary objectives, which included estimate change in population size between 2003 and 2018, and identify areas and habitats associated with any changes in density over time. And we wanted to identify core areas with above average density in one or both years. So while we were in the field, we surveyed line transects using a method called distance sampling. So this is a design-based approach that relies on survey design and accounts for imperfect detection of birds, which means that Birds that are present during surveys may not be counted because they are missed for a variety of reasons. So birds will go undetected, but we can achieve accurate estimates of population size using distance sampling when certain assumptions are met. 
For example, this map shows a set of transects across both islands. We surveyed each transect by walking at a steady pace from one end of the island to the other, counting every bird that we observed out to a maximum distance on each side of the transect. So the white birds represent birds that were counted, it just kind of gives you an idea of how they might be distributed. And the red birds represent birds that we missed. So we made sure to count all birds that were directly in front of us on the transect line, which satisfies one critical assumption of distance sampling. We also made sure to record the initial location of the bird using a GPS unit for accuracy, which satisfies a second critical assumption. And finally, we measured the exact distance from the transect to the bird using a rangefinder, which satisfies a third critical assumption that all distances must be measured correctly. After we completed field work, we combined the survey data for both years and did some statistical modeling to produce a percentage representing the overall chance of counting a bird present during the surveys. During surveys, there may be several characteristics that either increase or decrease the chance of counting birds. We included a group of these characteristics in the modeling process that we thought might have an influence on whether birds were counted. And the most influential characteristics from our analysis included the individual observer, the amount of rock tundra alpine habitat, and group size of birds. So the arrow pointing up for observer means our chances of counting birds increased with the observer's ability to count birds. And the arrows pointing down show that our chances of counting birds decreased with more rock tundra alpine habitat and larger group sizes of birds. And our overall chance of counting a bird when it was present during surveys was around 58%. So all of this information is necessary because once we determine the overall chance of counting birds and the characteristics that influence this chance, we conducted a spatial analysis using a density surface statistical model. Now this is a two-stage approach that uses the model results from the bird counts and adds information on the habitat features of a location that vary across the landscape so that we can estimate density and population size. So we chose habitat features from a land cover classification product that was created using satellite imagery for the islands so that we could look at specific habitat features associated with the number of birds that we counted. For example, we know that they really like rock tundra alpine habitat because they primarily nest in rock crevices so we might expect to see more birds in this particular habitat type compared to others. Now, we did not predict relationships for every habitat feature listed here, but we did consider biologically relevant features that we had available information on from the land cover classification. So before we make abundance predictions, there is a lot of work that goes into preparing the data for a density surface model but I will keep it brief and focus on some of the major steps. So we start by subdividing transects into smaller segments that are relatively equal in area. And we then summarize habitat features and bird counts within each one of those segments along each transect. And then we build a statistical model with all the bits and pieces of information that are necessary before we can make predictions for abundance. And a huge benefit of segmenting the transects and looking at these smaller areas is that we can more closely evaluate variation and abundance relative to the habitat features that we chose for our models. So without getting overly technical here, I'll briefly describe what the output from some of these models looks like. Now these graphs are part of a generalized additive model which essentially models spatial variation in density, which will improve the precision of an abundance estimate because you're accounting for all the various sources of uncertainty. 
And the model output includes information on the relationship between each habitat feature that we chose and McKay's bunting abundance. So the plot on the left suggests that abundance increases with more rock tundra alpine habitat, which we do consider an expected relationship because McKay's buntings likely prefer this type of habitat for nesting. And the plot on the right, you can see that it suggests that abundance increases up to a certain value of elevation, which in this graph is like right around 180 meters or roughly 600 feet high. So it's important to note that we definitely exercise appropriate caution when interpreting these plots because the shaded gray areas are confidence bands and they get wider as the curve decreases in the plot on the right for elevation. Now you'll notice that the black tick marks on the x-axis show the range of sampled values and there aren't as many samples as elevation increases, which helps explain why we see such wide confidence bands and we have less certainty in abundance, uh, really having a strong relationship with higher elevation values. So the take home message from these plots is that within each segment, abundance increases with a certain amount of a habitat type or the average value for a feature of interest that is correlated with abundance. So these graphs do not tell us what's causing changes in abundance, but they only show us potential relationships between the habitat features and abundance. So that's a really important note to take away from this. So a final step using this approach is to predict and map McKay's bunting abundance across the entire area of the islands. To do that, we first create a prediction grid and we summarize those chosen habitat features in each prediction grid cell. So we use the model output that I just showed in the previous slide to then predict abundance for both years. We then sum abundance to get total population size estimates and take the difference in those estimates to get an overall measure of population change. And finally, we produce these spatial maps that illustrate differences in abundance between both years. And that looks something like this. So each map here represents one survey year with 2003 on the left and 2018 on the right. And the legend in the middle is on the same scale for both years and it represents number of birds per grid cell across both islands. So the dark shading means that there are more birds in a grid cell and the lighter shading means there are fewer birds in a grid cell. So if you just take a few seconds to look at each map and notice some of the spatial patterns that show up. So to me, right away, I see that there are just less birds overall in 2018, which is really noticeable on the northern half of Hall Island and across most of the interior portions of St. Matthew Island. And another thing that I notice is if you look at the coastline of St. Matthew, a lot of those areas also have less birds in 2018 compared to 2003. And in contrast to these patterns of loss, it looks like there are areas on both islands in 2018 that still have darker areas of shading, which su suggests that buntings may be concentrating in specific locations in the most recent survey year. So when we summed abundance to get population size estimates for both years, the 2003 estimate was very close to the first published estimate, which was right around 31,000 birds. Now, the 2018 estimate was considerably lower with around 18,975 birds. Both estimates are highlighted in orange to give you an idea of that difference. And I also list these the 95% uh, confidence intervals, which represent the range of plausible values for these estimates. We also list the CV percentage, which represents a coefficient of variation that is indicating 
the precision of each estimate with the lower values suggesting higher precision. So our estimates were relatively precise of 5% CV is, is pretty good. So overall, our results suggest an estimated loss of over 12,000 birds between 2003 and 2018, which is a 40% decrease in mckays Montaigne population size. So once we had the result on the population decline, we specifically looked at areas across the islands that were associated with substantial population change. And you'll see in this map that there's a lot of red. So the areas in red represent declines and areas in white represent stability in the estimates. This map shows that there are no areas on either island that showed an increase in population size between the two survey years. And there are obvious noticeable declines on St. Matthew Island and on the southern half of Hall Island. So this map took us one step closer to identifying where population change was greatest on the breeding islands. And it also led us in the direction of our third research objective, which brings us to this map showing areas of importance using above or below average density estimates for each year. So we rated importance as number of years with above or below average density and use different colors in the map to represent low, average, or high density areas. So you'll notice that there's a gray shaded area in this map and that illustrates the substantial decline and it comes directly from the previous map that I showed of population change. So we just overlaid that population decline onto these areas of relative importance. So a few things that really stand out to me when I look at this map is that first, the dark and light purple grid cells are areas of low density. And most of these areas on St. Matthew fall within that gray shaded area of decline. Another thing that stands out to me is that the yellow and red grid cells, which represent areas of high density, suggests that there are potential poor breeding areas that are of high relative importance to the population. So there is a lot going on in this map, but I think it's just a really elegant way to look at areas that we are seeing high concentrations of birds and also areas where we are seeing uh, substantial decreases. So why are McKay's buntings declining in some areas and concentrated in others? So what we did was we used our available data from these maps to look at habitat and landscape differences in these areas of change. So what types of habitats were in these areas with low densities versus high? And low density areas and areas with declines contained more shrub and coastal habitat types and were on average closer to the coast. So the top picture, it's important to point out here that this shows what one type of shrub habitat can look like on St. Matthew. And you can see that there are rocks interspersed throughout what is characterized as a shrub dominated area, but the rocks are very small and the nest crevices in these types of rocks tend to be really shallow. In contrast, high density areas and areas that were considered stable over time contained more rock tundra alpine habitat were higher in elevation, steeper in slope, and were farther from the coast. So the bottom picture was taken in a high elevation rock tundra boulder field. And this is an area where rocks are very large and the nest crevices are quite deep. And therefore providing better shelter and protection for buntings from weather or predators. So we consider this kind of prime breeding habitat. So kind of gets me to the summary here, which is that our results suggest that the McKay's bunting population on St. Matthew and Hall Islands experienced a considerable reduction as evidenced by an overall population decline of 40% over a 15 year time period. Declines were substantial across St. Matthew Island and disproportionately occurred in lower quality habitat that was closer to the coast. 
So we, <clears throat> from our work, cannot imply causal relationships between the decline and potential population limiting factors. However, our results suggest that these patterns of decline mostly occurred in what is considered suboptimal breeding habitat. So these areas were also closer to the coast, which may overlap with red foxes that have been observed denning adjacent to seabird colonies. And this could be potentially increasing perception of predation risk for buntings and influencing where they are distributed across the landscape. We have also observed buntings nesting on coastal sea cliffs, and it is possible that coastal, coastal erosion impacts have reduced availability of nest sites, which may help explain the shift in distribution away from coastal areas and into interior areas. So there's a lot to unpack, but overall outcomes of this research will inform long-term monitoring of the population trajectory now that we have identified this decline. And our results will very likely update the conservation status of McKay's buntings now that we can provide this first population trend estimate. We also now have this series of spatial maps that we can use to guide monitoring on the breeding grounds and focus efforts on these core breeding areas so that we can compare any new data with our results and monitor the effects of ecological change on this population over time. So that brings me to the final slide where we, you know, we want to sort of put it out there that we're interested in conducting a future study that's focused on wintering McKay's buntings. We really want to better understand how adult survival might be impacted throughout the rest of their annual cycle. So we're interested in collaborating with communities located along the Bering Sea coast to collect observations of McKay's buntings in the winter. So this goes out to anyone who's joining this evening that is in a community where you have seen a McKay's bunting. And if you would like to share your you know, observations with us or pictures, you know, my contact information is provided here and we really would love to hear from you. And with that, I thank you so much for your time and I guess we can open it up to discussion, questions and anything that anyone would like to share about the McKay's bunting. All right, thank you, Rachel. So we are gonna open it up for questions. I know I've got some um, and I'm sure everyone else does, but the straight science audience knows, give the speaker some love in the chat box. It is not, tonight it was not easy to be a straight science speaker. Uh, we had all the uh, techno technology glitches. So thank you all. And uh, a big shout out to Rachel for persevering tonight. So with that, and I do see that in the chat box, there is a link to the video. Um, so yeah. the video yeah. that you were gonna show so people can download that. And, and usually that's a glitch at our end if we try to show a video, but that's what, that's uh, you're in Anchorage. So I, I don't know, we're just seem to be star-crossed tonight, you and I. <laughs> so um, give the speaker some love while you're thinking of your questions. And, and is Carol, Carol, are you, are you on? because I'm gonna put your picture up that I did send to the speaker. Carol Gales, are you on? I saw Jim. Yeah. She wanted you to see it. So I might, I might put it up just so others in the audience that may not be from Nome can see what it looked like at a feeder here uh, a day or two ago. So I'll put that up. Um, but in the interim, we'll look at the chat. The first comment was actually, um, are there no McKay's buntings on the Chukotkin coast? Um, I don't, not that we know of, not that we know of. Um, are you are you looking over there or at, do you have contacts over there? I mean, we, you're talking to the Bering Strait region, so that's our first thing is everything's transboundary up at this latitude. So we share everything. So it just seems interesting that their birds would not go over that way. Yeah, we don't have contacts there. So, uh, okay. Yeah, I, it, you know, and so, but we just don't know, right? So there's still okay. areas that are unexplored during the winter where these birds could be 
Um, so we're really kind of just going off of um, a lot of eBird observations. Uh, as a matter of fact, these three photos in the slide that I have up now were accessed from eBird. So, um, so that's really where I've been sort of keeping an eye on how many people are putting observations of McKay's buntings into eBird so that I can see where they're showing up throughout the Sea region. So as oh. far as outside okay. of Alaska, I'm actually not sure um, if they show up anywhere else, but. So I'll, anyone have a question? There's, there's quite a bit of um, good comments. Let's see. And Rachel, if you want to just, um, you can put your other slide back up, but I'll just show this one to sort of give those who may be sure. from your shop a, a sort of a. Let's do that. Yes. And as Jim Dory said, and this is going to be actually, Jim, this is your feeder. I'm going broke feeding McKay's buntings in Icy View. So let's, I'm going to share that screen, uh, share my screen here, and I've got that picture open. Uh, Can you see that picture? Everybody? You see that, Rachel? You're muted, Rachel. Oh yeah, I said that is that's amazing. I've so uh, Jim Dory, I don't know if you want to get off off uh, mute and and maybe give a walkthrough of this and how common this is at your feeder and why you're going broke. or not. All right, let me get back to the chat. Oh, he doesn't have a microphone. He's saying, ah, shucks, you can call into call to the uh, cell phone here at the house if you want to speak to the speaker. I mean, speak, yeah, speak to the speaker. And you're getting questions. People want to know what you're feeding. Rick Toman wants to know, is that one snow bunting in the picture? There is Rick, good eye. White millet seems to be bringing, bringing them in. Thank you, Jim. So for, for people who are interested in McKay's bunting, is this, is this of interest, this sort of picture? Rachel, to you. Oh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is this sort of picture that we're just showing, this was just taken a, a day or two ago, um, is this kind of thing expected or did you know this is uh, what happens? And I don't know if this is maybe that we have other people in Nome here that are, are bird aficionados, you used one of their photos and, and nice credit, nice shout out to them. That's pretty, pretty exciting and great to see. But, um, you know, for us, I don't, couldn't tell you if the numbers of McKay's buntings are going up or not in this region. And, and some of the people that are more really good birders in our region are here online. And uh, um, okay, we have a mic working now. All right, Jim, so and some shelled black sunflower, white millet and shelled black sunflower. That is what's drawn those birds in. Um, so I guess I'll open that up. Does anyone have a question for the speaker? Oh, Peter does. Go ahead, Peter. Peter's with the Gnome Nugget. Hi, that was really interesting. Thanks so much. And I and and uh, one of your colleagues shared the video, so I look forward to watching that afterwards. Um, exactly to the question that um, Jim just got asked, um, what do they eat on St. Matthew's Islands, and should residents of Gnome be are there things that you think we should be feeding them uh, obviously they like white millet and shell black sunflowers um but are there i i think of the equivalent you know what is the mckay's bunting equivalent to a pollinator garden is there some kind of habitat that would be beneficial to the population uh that people in gnome could build hmm. Okay, great question. So there are three questions you asked. And the first one is, what do they eat on St. Matthew Island? So they are feeding on insects when insects are available, but they're also foraging on berries and seeds. So they kind of have a diverse diet, but they really focus on insects when it's time to feed their young. 
um, because insects provide a lot more protein than berries or seeds. So that's primarily what we've seen them foraging on. We haven't studied that directly, but we have made a lot of observations on, um, you know, different items that they're bringing to nestlings. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I'm not sure uh, what they should be fed in Nome. I'm just assuming that any birdseed millet or black oiled sunflower seeds, which seem to be pretty common uh, winter feeding foods, um, are probably okay. I don't really have a lot of experience uh, with that, so I can't speak more to specific food types for winter feeding, but, and then the third one, um, what kind of habitats in Nome? So it's, they're really only in Nome during the winter. So Nome, I think, is covered by quite a bit of snow and ice in the winter, so I think that they really are relying on bird seed, and that's probably a good thing for them on some levels because there isn't a lot of food available for them during the winter. But I don't think there's a specific habitat type that could be designed for them in the winter because they're, they're really used to snow. I mean, they, they live in these really harsh climates, and I think that that's something that just, you know, they've evolved over time to really be living in these kind of climates. So. Once winter is over in Nome, though, they take off and head out to the islands, and the habitat then at that time of year is really different from the winter. So I hope that maybe answered your questions a little bit, but feel free to jump in and let me know if... if yeah, absolutely. No, that was, that, um, that was all of them. You know, we have, it kind of comes up in every single one of these, but we have had such a weird winter with freezing rain, then snow, then freezing rain, then snow. So, so it's incredibly diff diff difficult for any species to forage. Um, because no one can get through the layers of, not even musk oxen can get through the layers of ice. Ice, um, yeah. So what, you know, what is a bird that's the size of a coffee cup going to do when a musk oxen can't? So mm -hmm. that was yeah. interesting. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions. I really appreciate it. Um, and there's some comments, more comments about the diet that we see here in Nome, and that is... Uh, after after I did a rod, they like leftovers in the dog yard. So you probably don't know, but when I did a rod comes, there's a big kind of parking lot by the down off Front Street on the street right by the water, uh, ice. And so there's a big yard in there. It's got security now, and they, and they lay down straw, and the dogs are in there. There can be hundreds of dogs laid out in there before they get shipped back out to wherever they need to go. So it, that's the dog yard where the snow snow. Uh, I would say snowbirds, but the McKay's buntings and snow buntings will be, uh, will be. Uh, they, so they like the leftovers, the kibbles and whatnot. They like the Iditarod dog lot leftover straw. Herds of them hang out during that period after the race. Pete, Pete Rob writes, when seen feeding along the coast, not, not at feeders, I see them feeding on beach grass seeds. That seems right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of them feeding them. Yeah, Carol got it too. Carol said the same thing. Yeah. And and my have you, has anyone ever tagged these things or or I guess they've been banded. Oh, uh, right? so, um, to my knowledge, there has been banding of McKay's buntings on the Yukon Cuscapoon Delta, but outside of that, I so they've never been banded in Nome. I, I'm pretty sure that they haven't been banded in Nome. Um, so yeah, I think just uh, there was a study many years ago where they um, were capturing and, and banding and recapturing McKay's buntings on the Yukon Cuscapoon Delta. So there is some data about return rates, so birds coming back and then being able to recapture them again. And so I have a little bit of understanding of what that might look like in the winter, and that does make the, the YKD, the Yukon Cuscapoon Delta, a very interesting place um, when thinking about where large concentrations of these birds might show up. Outside of Nome, we do know that they are showing up in Nome in really large concentrations as well. So, so and yeah. That, it, oh, go ahead. Oh, just saying, yeah, that's the only only study that I'm aware of. But um, but there could there could be others that I just not don't know about. All right. Um, and the, there's another question, Peter. Your hand is still up, but I see your question in the chat box, and that is about the study. And that was you walked all the transects. How far was that and how much, how far did you walk in total? Um, I was actually just trying to pull up the total because it was a lot and, and we didn't, 
you know, we had multiple observers that uh, were surveying these transects, but we did do a lot of walking. And I think I have the total number of kilometers that we walked. It was something like, well, so St. Matthew Island is about 314 square kilometers and Hall Island's about 18 square kilometers. And the transects, I think, totaled over 100 something kilometers. So, so we walked, yeah, collectively over 100 kilometers when surveying these islands. And a lot more on St. Matthew, obviously, because it's a, it's a bigger island. So and you got to walk Hall Island as well? I did, yeah. I, I got to be part what of a that trip. Day. Yeah, it's an incredible island. It's uh, much different in some regard. Um, so it's the lichen communities there are really lush and beautiful and undisturbed because there were never any reindeer that were on that island. But there were, however, I'm not sure if you were aware of this, uh, there were reindeer that used to be on St. Matthew Island. They were introduced there and they eventually, their population crashed, but they ate so much of the lichens that they essentially ate their entire food source and could not be supported any longer. So there are no longer reindeer on St. Matthew Island, but because of how many there were, I mean, it got up to like 6,000 individuals, it really changed the composition of the habitat there on St. Matthew. So when you go to, when you go to Hall Island, uh, you see these just very lush lichen mats in, in the vegetation are slightly different than St. Matthew that's still recovering from years and years and years, like 20 years of, of overgrazing by these introduced reindeer. So it's, it's an amazing place. Both islands are incredible, but there are definitely some environmental differences and habitat differences when you're on one or the other. So. And, so. and I see, I see you, Dean, but I'm going to, I'm going to say thank you to Rachel and say that I have a little story that maybe people don't know. It's from our region, the Bering Street region regarding, um, and I'll get to you, Dean, regarding St. Matthew Island and one of the most innovative shipwreck stories uh, locally here from St. Lawrence Island. I don't know, are you aware of that, Rachel? Mm -hmm. People from St. Lawrence Island, Island were were shipwrecked, found themselves in a storm situation, and were able to, even though the boat was, and it was a skin boat, of course, this was a long time, not that long ago, but long enough people were just using skin boats. Though the skins were damaged beyond repair, they were able to sail back to, uh, back home from St. Matthew. It took a long time for the, before they could launch, and how they built their boat and how they were able to navigate is one of the greatest uh, innovative adventure and, and, and really uh, full scale about the knowledge uh, at the subsistence um, level when you utilize the entire ecosystem. It is a beautiful story. But anyway, that's a St. Matthew one. So you've heard that? Yeah, bits and pieces of it. I've heard okay. of shipwreck stories around the region too. Um, yeah, but from, from here, this was, uh, you know, with you know, skin boat and a long way from St. Lawrence Island. Not a problem. Real mariners up here. Um, <laughs> and Dean, you had a question. Sorry, I got excited yes, about did. the story. Go First ahead. All, thank you, Rachel. Enjoyed your talk. Everybody seemed to be focused on the feed. But if we look at populations throughout Alaska, you see these oscillations between predators, uh, lemmings, uh, snowshoe hare or hare in general, and you have these oscillations. You only have two years of data, and one year could be a low fox data year, and one year could be a high fox data. So are you looking at anything that can relate it to the predators causing this decline? Thank you so much for that question. So when we were doing our transect surveys, we were also recording information on foxes and other predators such as Jaegers. Um, so for foxes though, we made sure that every time we detected one, we counted it the same way that we counted a bird. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of sightings of foxes during our transect survey. So that information didn't really tell us much more about whether foxes were, you know, one of the primary factors in the, the decline. So it does open up an area of research though, because if there were future studies that could focus on censusing the population or coming up with a density or 
abundance estimate for foxes, we could really get at whether or not they are concentrated in areas where buntings are, and if direct predation event, events are having more of an influence, or just overall, what does that look like for the fox population? Because we know that red foxes have moved into the St. Matthew Islands and have outcompeted Arctic foxes. So there aren't as many Arctic foxes as there used to be historically, and there are now more red foxes. So they've successfully established breeding population, but we haven't looked specifically at what absolute density looks like for foxes. So, so that is an area of future research and it would be fantastic to, to look at that. And second to that, there's also an endemic singing bowl on the island. And uh, we know that, you know, vole, vole populations cycle, and, uh, but we don't have any information on what that looks like for St. Matthew. We just have anecdotal observations of singing voles being everywhere across the landscape. They really are. They, they appear to have been in high abundance during both years of the survey. But again, we didn't officially test that or look at that. So that would be another area of future research to sort of look at how many how many voles are on the island and how many foxes are on the island. That would really add to the story. So yeah, thank you for asking those questions. It's something that we, we hope to do in the future. So, so gut feeling, food or predators? Yeah. You, you don't have a choice, huh? I don't have a choice. Uh, and the food thing is interesting because, uh, again, we, we, we just didn't directly test that. But the availability of food, yes, could certainly play a role in, you know, how uh, healthy these individuals are and whether they survive. And so, again, that's another area of future research. And we're hoping to really incorporate a lot of these suggestions for how to move forward with long-term monitoring because, you know, we are missing information on a lot of the ecological processes that are occurring on the island, but the data that we do have really sets us up to get to the other parts of this story. And so for me, I don't really know if it's food versus predators or if it's something else that's occurring outside of the, their breeding range. So that's what we're kind of hoping to get to with a winter, winter study. Thanks. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, no, I like it. It's really good. It gets me thinking. And, and I like to try to articulate what could possibly be going on with these birds because we, you know, we don't know the actual cause of the decline. So um, yeah, it's great to talk about it. Thank you so much. All right. You still game for a couple more questions and comments because there's sure. lots yet. Okay. So in line with predation, um, Anna writes, we've seen, so Gnome, we've seen northern shrikes in recent years in Gnome. Are they a possible predator on hmm. the McKay's or snow bunting? I think that they could be, but I know that northern shrikes, um, I'm not sure how large of, of prey they take, but I know that they're capable of taking what they want. So um, without having any personal experience, I'm not sure, but it, it potentially um, it's interesting that you're seeing northern shrikes there now, but I'm not sure if they would, and maybe they would predate on them, but someone else in the audience could have better information. I feel like snow bunnies are a lot larger than some passerines that I've seen northern shrikes predate on, but, uh, but it's a possibility. So if someone ever saw that, would love to know. <laughs> All right, then we have an, another one, and that is, do any snow buntings? the hardy other cousin, that do any snow buntings nest on St. Matthew or Hall Island? A great question. So again, we've only been out there uh, in two different survey years uh, doing this work. And during the early 2000s, the three surveys, they did count snow buntings when they were doing the transects, but they barely counted any. So then we go back in 2018 and, and we, had five snow buntings that were counted on um, the transect surveys. So not very many. We have never monitored a snow bunting nest on either one of those islands. So that hasn't, there is no information on whether or not they've successfully nested there, but because we have seen them in low numbers, yes, can they get to the island? Absolutely. Are they there? In large numbers, no, they're not, not right now and not what we've seen in uh, previous years. So, so yeah, so they might be, I mean, we're only, you know, you have to remember too that 
when we go out there, we're only, you know, we're able to walk across most of the island, but when we stayed to do a little bit of nesting work, we were only kind of working in a few areas on the island. So it's possible that snow buntings can be nesting out there and we just haven't detected them. But given the low number of birds on the transect, snow buntings, we, we, it's tough to say if they're really establishing like, you know, a breeding population that's mixing with the McKay's bunting population. They seem to still be pretty separated in terms of where they breed and reproduce at, at this time, so. All right, thank you, Rachel. And um, Rob, I, I think you can save your singing bowl imitation to the end. Okay. That would be good, um, but I'd love to hear it. Don't get me wrong. And they don't then, actually sing. <laughs> and then um, uh, Michelle writes, hi, Rachel, super nice talk. She's right there and amazing photos. Did you find evidence of nesting? Oh yeah, so um, that's a second part. I didn't include that information in tonight's uh, presentation, but so in 2003, Steve Matsuoka and Jim Johnson and, and Dan Ruthroff and others were out there and they started a nesting ecology study. So they monitored a handful of nests um, for about a month. And I should mention too that in the early 80s, uh, there were folks out there that were doing seabird surveys and they monitored whatever nests they found incidental to the work that they were already doing. So we have a little bit of data of McKay's buntings nesting in the early 80s. And we have the data from 2003. And then when we were out there in 2018, after the transect surveys were completed, five of us stayed behind on the island for another four, four and a half weeks. And we monitored nests. So we searched for and monitored as many nests as we could find. And so we do have really good data uh, from several of those years. And we're including that as part of this story and it'll be included in a, a peer reviewed manuscript uh, that we hope to share soon. And so we do have some interesting stuff on nesting data. And just to throw it out there, we, we've shown that nest success is really high for these birds. So they are reproducing, they are replacing themselves. And we don't believe that you know, that what it, it's harder to believe that something going on on the breeding grounds is has really influenced these birds as heavily as we've seen, just given their really high nest success in all of the years that we have data for. So, um, so that's another part of the story, and we will be sharing that information soon. I smell a straight science, a redo, <laughs> <laughs> a redo and a revision. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then. I'm going to the next question. I just want to let you know that we do have high school students uh, in the audience tonight. And it made me think, and I'm glad you're on, Dylan. Um, it made me think because there's a here's a question right here from Jim Dory. Um, what would be of interest to you from local observers and for USGS, as it looks like you're concerned about the number of birds going down? Is there an opportunity for USGS to work with people in the region or have, uh, you know, ig sort of ignite a research? Um, opportunity for people here. I mean, you know, we're right in town. You can, you know, drive the roads and, and that sort of thing during the winter. Is that of, of uh, so I guess the question is, what do you want to hear from us? And in the back of your mind, be thinking, I think you have the opportunity here to get a lot more interest, information on McKay's buntings during the winter in a, in a Northern Bering Sea, Bering Strait community. Yeah, that, thank you for asking that. So I think for our observations and, uh, you know, we'd love to just know what are you seeing? And if you counted the birds, how many birds are coming to your feeder? How many birds are you seeing every day? If you keep a tally of those birds every day, that would be really neat to look at how many birds you have at one period of time and how that changes throughout the winter. So just any kind of information, but really if you wanted to share with us you know, if birds are coming to your house or to your feeder, having that information about location would be great and number of birds. Um, if you see snow buntings that are mixed in the McKay's bunting flocks or vice versa, and we love pictures. So I think for now, we're really just trying to reach out to the public and the communities to let people know that we're interested in doing this work and we want to be able to do it collaboratively with the community. So 
So yeah, I think in the future, we could see something like that happening where we are working with the community to learn more about these birds during the winter. Right, well, you have a lot of opportunity here, a lot of interested people. And, and like I say, we have students that are also, um, you know, looking at different ideas on what lies ahead for opportunities and things like that. So, um, all right, if you're still going for it. The next one is, I thought I heard snow buntings and McKay buntings are being lumped taxonomically um, and being considered one species. How does that square with the very different breeding areas and how would it affect your research funding about the pop with population concerns? Yeah, well, so right now uh, they're different genetically, but there, you know, there has been evidence of gene flow. So we know that they also are capable of hybridizing. Um, so for now, they're still considered two separate biological species, but that could change over time. And I, you know, there um, has been work that has genetically analyzed how similar these two species are. So if you look that up, there's some really great information on that, but we still need more information to really, I guess, uh, kind of push it more towards lumping them as one species. So I, I don't know how that will change over time, but I know that it will be considered again, whether or not they should be separate or they should be lumped. Uh, how does that work with the very different breeding area? So right now, you know, they this, there is this geographic barrier that plays a role in, in keeping these birds apart. And it's thought that there are differences in arrival times for these birds when they make it to the breeding ground. So McKay's buntings stay in Alaska year round. So they're closer to their breeding areas, right? But snow buntings migrate out of Alaska and they have to migrate back up to make it to their breeding areas. So because there's differences in when these birds can arrive on their breeding grounds, you would expect that McKay's buntings are going to make it out to St. Matthew Island. And because, you know, there are, a lot of McKay's buntings, not as much as there were, but there are a lot of them. So they are, you know, they have this ability to outcompete or sort of keep, you know, they're very territorial. So they keep snow buntings away from St. Matthew. And that's been going on for a long, 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 long time. And because we haven't seen large numbers of snow buntings on St. Matthew, it suggests it's pretty effective. So I think um, as of now, you know, they're, they're separated by this geographic barrier, but you know they're not necessarily reproductively isolated from each other, but we just need more information on that moving forward. So um, how would that affect research funding? Funding. Mm -hmm. Funding, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know how it would affect research funding, but it would, you know, it would change, it would change a sort of the trajectory of you know what we're doing, but. Um, I guess we'll just have to see over time what that looks like, but but I'm not sure how it would affect funding. All right. Well, I think I think there's a more comments, and I think I hope that that it's opening the ears and eyes of uh, of the Alaska Science Center and the and the bird researcher researchers. So for that feeder that you saw, the picture of the blue feeder, uh, Jim says he's had when you were asking how many do you, is at your house. I've had up to forty plus buntings, but they are mixed. That's just at the feeder. I'm not the greatest at distinguishing immature from the snows, but definitely a mixed group. We, we, will, we do see snow buntings throughout the summer here in the mountains in Nome. And is, is that also at the feeder in Icy View during the summer, Jim? Or only away from the feeder? Your last chat comment, the feeder in Icy View. And I don't know if that information is is novel that we see snow bunting. Okay, the large group is ice, in icy view at that feeder is in the winter time only. That kind of numbers come into the feeder. Or is any of this unexpected for you? I you know I'm not a bird, a small bird person. So. It's all great information though. And if anyone else, you know, I'm curious, have we seen more or less buntings over time in the gnome area? Uh, any of you gnome, gnome mites have any comment on that over the last 20 years? 
Anyway, is any of this unexpected, Rachel, for you? Is this a good surprise or what you expected? Uh, for the, I'm sorry, for use, the use of the use of the McKay's buntings, they're sort of their patterns and that we see snow buntings all summer here in the mountains. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, is it expected to see I'm sorry, could you reframe the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I believe you made <laughs> I, was reading, I was reading the chat at the same time, so. Oh, okay, all right. So so they're seeing, we see snow buntings in the summer here in Nome. So that, you know, we see them in the winter, we see them in the summer. To me, it, your comment about migrating out and having to come back, I, I mm -hmm. just hope that's the case. And is any of that kind of unexpected if it's expected for snow buntings to sort of take off and then return, but maybe we have residential ones. Um, yeah, so. sure. Yeah, I think that sure some of them probably stick around if they have the resources that they need in the winter. Why migrate far, far away? So I mean, you right. know, say that it's probably likely the majority of the population makes a migratory movement, but there, are, there can always be individuals that stay behind, and and we are seeing a lot of birds that are showing up and spending time in winter that they never really used to be in. So it's it's uh I wouldn't say it's unexpected, but um, sure, yeah, there are snow buntings mixed in and they stay in Alaska. But, you know, the thing with McKay's buntings is they don't leave Alaska and we know that. Uh, they are resident throughout the year and they stay here. They are endemic to Alaska. So they're here during the entire year. Um, so I think that having that information from Nome where you're seeing snow buntings mixed in with McKay's buntings at feeders would be really valuable because, you know, changes are occurring and they're occurring rapidly. So over time, if, if you're documenting how many birds are coming to your feeder and counting them or just kind of, you know, doing your best to count them, but, it, but you'll probably start to see a pattern show up the longer you do that. And so I think it's very interesting to hear people's observations about how many snow buntings they're seeing with the McKay's buntings in Nome for sure. So we, we like that information. All right, and one last comment, and then I have one last question, just because your your news on St. Matthew Island, there's something about that that really raised a question for me. Um, so from Kate, who also took the photo that you used, which was great in, in your thing, just I don't know if you two have met, but now you kind of have, it's that kind of a night. It seems to me that in recent years, the numbers of overwintering snow buntings has increased. A larger portion of the mixed flocks seems to be snow buntings than in the past. A larger portion of the mixed flocks seem mm -hmm. to be snow buntings, more snow buntings than in the past. Wow, so yes, so, so that's a pattern. And that kind of information would be of interest to us too, because you might expect that some sort of pattern is similarly occurring with McKay's buntings, but maybe less McKay's buntings because there are now overall less McKay's buntings than there were. 15 years ago. So, so those kind of patterns, yes, it would be really, really nice to have more information on that moving forward. And we've got to get you a little bit more hooked in, I think, with transboundary communications, uh, which I think we, I think there's ways to do that with the Park Service actually here in Nome. Um, we do have federal to federal communications over the shared Beringia Park, if that helps you, or Thank if you're you. of interest. Mm -hmm. in that. Um, you might want to put up your contact slide again. Okay. For everybody. So if there's, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if you want any of like, do you, if you talk, does, do you want fish? We have a fish and game office here that people often contact regarding birds. We have, um, there's this office. I'll often get reports of, of birds and all kinds of things. And I'll make sure that if you're interested, you know, know how to contact you. So yeah, I, I have your contact info, but um, also utilizing any of our, our media, KNOM radio or the Gnome Nugget is also another way if you want to advertise to try to get sightings, um, that kind of thing. Yes, that would be fantastic. All right, well, that's it. Thank you. You know, uh, thank you for putting up with the, the evening. My last question is. The one, the most unexpected thing I heard all night was that there are red foxes on St. Matthew Island. How is that, how, any ideas on how that occurred? Uh, yeah, so. Red foxes. 
Yeah, so red foxes. So, so they. What are, what's the thoughts on that? Yeah, they they made it to the island on their own. So you know, how far offshore is that island? That's four hundred miles. Yeah, well, four hundred kilometers. Yeah, I, so yeah. I don't know exactly where they came from, but they they were for, the first red fox was seen sometime in the late sixties. Right. So back then, you know, the sea ice extended all the way to the islands, to the coast. I mean, the sea ice extent was large. So yeah. it was frozen for a lot of months. And, and, and the foxes actually did journey to St. Matthew on their own and make it there on their own and establish the population. So they weren't by human. Uh, they weren't brought over there by ship. They actually made it there on their own by walking across the sea ice. Pretty so that that is probably the greatest adventure fox story that has never been told. Whoever that fox was that made it there and his buddy that pre keeps him going. That yes. is uh, incredible. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. I never wow. thought of red fox would make it to St. Matthew. Mm -hmm. So thank you. There's the contact information for Rachel. Um, and if there's no other questions, Oh, there's a new one in the chat. Oh, people are just putting in their kudos to you as they should. So be nice, straight science audience and, and lay, give some love to Rachel. There's some clapping. We're just so glad you came and talked to us and we're glad for all of you that were able to <laughs> make do and, and uh, find a way to join us tonight. Next week, we don't have anything scheduled for straight science next week, but there was interestingly a timely, some people saw it in the paper about Noah, I think a, a cod fisherman took a picture, a couple of pictures of right whales down in Bristol Bay that created a little media flurry today. Um, know that we're actually having good timing because on March 10th, that is our next straight science. We are having uh, Jessica Krantz from the NOAA uh, large cetacean program in Seattle. She will be doing a straight science on right whales. And we're going to be talking about the northern Bering Sea Bering Strait region regarding right whales. You heard me right there. And there's a lot of information that hasn't been brought to this region. And there's a lot of information this region has about right whales that we are now starting to maybe uh, get a better picture on so that they can understand that we do have right whales up here. And um, so that'll be a really interesting straight science. That's on the 10th. In between then, it's hard to believe it's almost time for Iditarod. And as Peter said, we have Iron Dog, which is the, if you don't know, Rachel, that's the big snow machine, world's longest snow machine race, or loudest anyway. And then um, we have a military drill coming to Nome for, for a, a couple of days, 200 troops coming to do some you know, the Bering Strait is getting a little bit more scrutiny. So we've got military coming out to do some drills and I did a run. So thank you so much, Rachel. Stay on the line if you could and, and uh, we'll thank. Oh, thanks, Rob. Rob put, dropped in the chat box the, uh, the, the blip today that was about those right whales that were seen in Bristol Bay. They say there's only 30 of these whales left in the country, but or left in our waters, but um, we may change that up here. Kind of like finding McKay's buntings, 40 at a feeder. <laughs> so thank you all so much. And we'll see you next time.